This is a 2020 Volkswagen Jetta, and it's a nice little car. It was once the nice little car, the compact sedan you got if you wanted something a little nicer than a Honda Civic or a Toyota Corolla. But in the last few years, sales have declined dramatically, and people just don't seem that interested in the Jetta anymore. Today, I'm going to review this car, and I'm going to explain what's going on. Actually, I can tell you what's going on with Jetta sales really, really fast. SUVs. The Jetta's best sales year here in the United States was 2012, when they sold almost 185,000 units. Last year, they managed to sell just over half that, even though the Jetta was an all-new, completely redesigned model. Check out this graph to see the decline in Jetta sales over the last decade or so. So, what happened to those buyers? Well, here's another graph for you. This is the sales of the Volkswagen Tiguan compact crossover in the same time period. In 2012, VW sold just 34,000 Tiguans. Last year, they sold almost four times that number. It seems all the people who were interested in the Jetta as a premium alternative to a regular compact car are now interested in the Tiguan as a premium alternative to a regular compact SUV. And meanwhile, Jetta sales are in decline. So, does it deserve it? Well, today I'm going to review this Jetta and find out. But first, a little overview. Now, the Jetta starts around $20,000 and works its way up to this model, the SEL Premium, with a sticker price of just under $30,000. All Jetta models are front-wheel drive, and they all use a 1.4-liter turbocharged four-cylinder with about 150 horsepower and 185 pound-feet of torque, except for the sporty Jetta GLI, which uses the same 2-liter turbo four from the VW GTI, about 230 horsepower. For my foreign viewers, the Jetta is a bit of an interesting anomaly because the Golf hatchback is far more popular than the Jetta in almost every market except for North America. But here, where we traditionally prefer sedans to hatchbacks, the Jetta still outsells the Golf roughly three to one, even in spite of its declining sales. But today, I'm going to review the Jetta, and I'm going to take you on a thorough tour of it and show you all of its interesting quirks and features. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the new Jetta inside, and I have to say the interior is pretty nice. A huge improvement over the outgoing Jetta. Still not a luxury car in here, but everything looks a lot better than the old model. Little known fact about me, I actually had the previous generation Jetta as a company car, and I worked at Porsche. It was horrible. The interior was terrible, and it's nice to see a big improvement for this latest generation. And it's not just the design of the interior, the style, but the build quality the materials as well, both how they look and how they feel. When you touch the buttons, the switches, nothing is shaky or flimsy. Everything seems well built, well done, kind of in keeping with this car's premium compact car reputation. And in addition to the relatively high quality interior, this car also has some nice features for the price point. This one's around $28,000, $29,000, and it has cooled seats, which is a pretty nice feature to have. A lot of cars at this price point or more expensive don't have them. You also have heated seats in here. That's less of a surprise, but over on the driver's side, you can see the heated seat button also activates the heated steering wheel, which is a bit of a surprise, a heated steering wheel in a car at this price point. And speaking of cooled and heated things in this car, one item a lot of people will like is that the climate controls are fully buttons and switches. There are no climate controls integrated into the infotainment system. So that way you don't have to go into different menus or screens just to turn on the AC or change where it's coming out. You can do it all from these buttons. And speaking of the infotainment system, when I first got in this car, I was initially surprised that the screen would only allow you to do one thing at a time. So for instance, if you have the navigation on, but you want to change the radio station, you have to close your navigation directions, go over to the radio tab, change the radio station, then go back to navigation. Most cars offer like a split screen. So you can
can have your directions and your radio on one screen so you don't have to switch in order to see them all, but not Volkswagen. But then I discovered that you can take your navigation map and put it in the gauge cluster screen. And then I discovered you can make it huge in the gauge cluster screen. So you basically have a full size gauge cluster screen map and then whatever you want on the infotainment screen. This is actually better than having a split screen setup when you think about it, because both screens are huge. So you're not actually giving up any screen size to see whatever you want. You can see a full map and a full radio, but this screen has some rather interesting quirks because it's almost too configurable. For example, you can go into your car info, select your oil temperature, and then you can hugeify that. <laughs> so you can minimize everything else so you have a giant display of your oil temperature, <laughs> just in case that might be something you want. And next up, another interesting gauge cluster item relates to the start-stop system, which turns off the engine to save fuel when the car is stopped. When you have the system switched on, the gauge cluster lets you know that it's on. On. But if you turn it off, it actually tells you, please activate the start-stop system. It wants you to have it on, and it's asking you nicely with a little please. The more interesting part of this, you can hugeify that. So it tells you, please turn on start-stop even bigger than before. <laughs> and one other interesting item in the gauge cluster, one of the displays you can have it show is your elevation. You can see it's giving my current elevation and this will update in real time as you're driving along. <laughs> this is mostly only useful to people who are off-roading and rock climbing in their vehicles. Not something you would expect to have on display in a Jetta. <laughs> but it's there if you want it to see what your elevation is. But while those are some humorous items in the gauge cluster screen, mostly I just love that that screen is there, gives this interior a real Audi feel at a much lower price point. And this car just has a ton of safety technology, some of which is controllable from in there. You have blind spot monitoring, lane keep assist that will steer you back into your lane. You have adaptive cruise control, forward collision braking, rear cross traffic alert. It is a really high tech car with basically all of the modern safety systems you would want. And next up, we move on to the infotainment screen, the center screen. There's a lot to like here too. Like for example, the fact that it can sense my hand approaching. Check this out. The screen is currently displaying what it's displaying, but as I bring my hand close, it pops up more menu items. I'm not touching the screen when it does that. It just senses that my hand has approached. I pull my hand away and those menu items go away to make the screen less cluttered because I'm not about to touch it. But when it senses that I am again about to touch it, you can see those menu items reappear and then disappear and reappear based on the placement of my hand near the screen. That's a cool little touch. Next up, another item I really love in this system is the screen screen called Energy Consumers. You click on that and it'll show you what accessories are consuming energy and lowering your fuel economy. You can see right now nothing. But if I turn on the climate control, you can see it's showing the climate control is using energy and it's showing how much energy it's using. When I turn it up, it increases. This is a cool screen to have in case you want to know what you can turn off in order to save energy and increase your fuel economy. But anyway, some rather interesting quirks of the infotainment system. One is the fact that when you set a navigation destination and you're about to tell it to take you there, one of your options can be include trailer. So if you're towing a trailer with your 147 horsepower Jetta, you can let the navigation system know that. And then I guess it'll avoid sending you down really narrow roads or roads with sharp turns. So you don't run into problems with towing. With that said, a couple of drawbacks. One, the screen is slightly small compared to rivals. Now, not tremendously small, especially with compact cars. A lot of them are about this size, but more and more screens are getting larger and larger, and this one is just starting to already feel kind of small. And next up, here's another interesting one. In the settings, you can choose which traffic market you want to see, but they only have a few cities listed, like seven or eight. And sorry, Houston, you didn't make the cut. Even though your metro area is larger than half the cities on this list, apparently Volkswagen thinks there is no traffic in Houston 
person. I guess Volkswagen has never sat on Loop 610 during rush hour, but it didn't make the cut. And this list is so small. There's no Atlanta, Miami, the San Francisco Bay Area is not on here. You have to choose between one of these limited traffic markets or else, I guess, no traffic market information. And next up, moving on from controls in the infotainment screen, let's talk buttons and specifically the fact that there are a lot of blanks in this car. On either side of the gear lever, you can see there's room for eight buttons, but only three of them are actually occupied. Now, I already told you this is the top end Jetta trim level. So what could these all be for? At some point, you have to wonder if Volkswagen just thinks that blank switches are trim. <laughs> And so they just add them in there because they think they look good. Well, they don't. It really makes you think that you skipped on a few options. But in this car, I don't really think you did. There are just blanks that can never be unblanked. And next up, moving on to the glove box, you have your Volkswagen navigation in here. It's in a DVD case, even though it's actually an SD card. And when you open it up, you can see a group of diagrams showing what you can and can't do with it. For instance, yes, you can hold it. No, you can't hold it there. No, you can't bend it like a rubber band. No, you can't sprinkle powder on it. Yes, you can put it in a case. No, you can't throw it away. No, you can't put tape on it. No, you can't get it wet. Thank you, Volkswagen, for this wonderful diagram tutorial about how to handle an SD card. Very useful information. And next we move on to the back seat in the new Jetta. And the first thing you notice when you get back here is it's surprisingly roomy, especially for a compact car. My knees have no problem. My head has no problem. It's not huge back here, but it's definitely big enough. Again, especially for a small sedan. I think Volkswagen's thought is these Jettas are primarily primarily selling here in North America, so they make them a little larger for USA buyer taste. Now, one interesting thing back here is you have heated rear seats, which is nice. You press these buttons, they turn on, no problem. Oddly, though, you don't have rear climate vents. It's very rare that you see a more luxurious item like heated rear seats, but then the absence of a pretty common standard item like rear climate vents. Not sure why Volkswagen decided to do one and not the other, but that's what they've done here. And next we move on to the horn. Now, usually I don't mention the horn in normal cars. I only mention it when it's weird or in some crazy special car, but I had to mention it here because this has to be the most pathetic sounding horn in the car industry. Have a listen. <laughs> Needless to say, if you get yourself into a road rage incident in a Jetta, you probably won't have any issues because the other person's just going to start laughing at you. <laughs> And next up, moving back here, you can see the Jetta's trunk, which is quite large. Very deep, goes really far back in here, impressively so. Larger than the trunk in the Corolla and a lot of other compact cars. Again, a pretty large trunk for a small sedan. Other than that, though, nothing at all interesting in the trunk. It is merely a trunk. And next up, I want to talk exterior styling. And frankly, this is one of the things that I don't really like about the latest Jetta. In fact, the last couple of Jettas, it just looks bland, kind of anonymous. Frankly, to me, if you were going to draw a car or a sedan, this is pretty much the shape you'd end up with. They've gone for what appears to be the most inoffensive, conservative design possible so they don't rock the boat and potentially upset or scare away customers. And the result is it's just not very interesting. It's too bland. Personally, I loved the fourth generation Jetta, which was sold here in North America from 1999 to 2005. That was a beautiful car with beautiful lines. This seems like kind of a bland disappointment by comparison. And finally, we move under the hood in the Jetta. Like I mentioned, it has a 1.4 liter turbocharged four cylinder, about 150 horsepower, which is normal for the class, and about 185 pound feet of torque, which is actually a pretty healthy number. Now, all of the North American spec Jetta models use this engine, except for the GLI, the sporty one, which has the same engine from the GTI. This is a big departure from the Jetta lineup in the past. There used to be a 
a Jetta Hybrid, of course there was a diesel, there were multiple gasoline engine varieties, but Volkswagen has pared down the Jetta's lineup to just this engine and the GLI, I guess in order to appeal to a still fairly large number of people, but also to significantly cut costs because Volkswagen's financial position isn't quite as healthy after its diesel emissions scandal. One other notable item to mention while I'm out here is the key. For one thing, the panic button, the alarm button on the key has an image of like an alarm going off and a person running away, I guess because you turned on the alarm and scared them away from breaking into your car. That's a bit of an interesting way to show it. The key also has a remote starter. If you press the lock button and then you press this little circle X2 button twice, the car will remote start itself, as you can see. Not too many cars will do that at this price point in the compact car segment. It's pretty nice to have. And so those are the quirks and features of the 2020 Volkswagen Jetta SEL Premium. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Jetta. Now, the last generation Jetta was really not a good car. It was a departure uh, from prior Jettas, which did have a deserved reputation of being kind of better compact cars than, you know, Japanese, Korean, American rivals. But the last generation was, was bad. So when I got into this one, I had pretty low expectations. But I'm happy to say that this car is better than I was expecting that it would be. The interior is a lot nicer than I thought it would be. It has a lot of good tech, um, probably among the highest tech compact cars. The gauge cluster screen configurability is better than what I see in a lot of cars that cost five times this money. Um, it's really well done. So then the question becomes driving experience. And there are some pros and cons here. Um, there's some stuff to like, the biggest of which to me is just how roomy this car is and relatively comfortable. A um, lot of interior space in the front, the back, the trunk. It, it's a pretty good, this car has a good use of space and it's roomy and it's big and uh, no complaints. But the driving experience itself is a little lackluster. Um, the powertrain is just not it's not anything other than a compact car powertrain. If you're buying a Jetta thinking you're getting some sporty German car, well, it's made in Mexico and it has 147 horsepower. It's not high performance. And the powertrain situation is a bit of a shame because they used to have multiple levels of Jettas and you could get a base gas engine and a fast gas engine and a GLI. Well, that's gone. You're now just kind of stuck with one powertrain or going all the way up to the GLI. Now, this engine is fine. By compact car standards, it's totally acceptable. There's no qualms, there's nothing bad about it. It's just certainly not fast, not much for highway passing. And even though the torque figure is a pretty strong number, 185 pound feet, it doesn't really feel stronger than a lot of the rivals. Um, it's, it's about the same as any other compact car now. So where it used to be the Jetta kind of gave you a little bit of a sportier driving feel compared to other compacts, that's now the Mazda 3. And I think what you get here is kind of the Volkswagen German brand name and a nice interior and good technology if you step up to a higher trim. And one thing worth noting about the sales figures I, I quoted earlier, um, a few years ago the Jetta Sport Wagon was rebranded as the Golf Sport Wagon. Um, and so Jetta sales figures had dropped a little bit because the station wagon is no longer included in the sales numbers. But that was never a big part of the sales here in the States anyway. Um, so it really hasn't contributed that much to the decline of the Jetta. Uh, the real culprit is the rise of crossovers and Volkswagen's own Tiguan. If you're really dead set on a compact car though, yeah, this is definitely one of the nicer ones I've been in. The interior is a lot nicer than Corolla. Toyota does offer a hybrid Corolla, which Volkswagen doesn't, um, and that gives it more of an advantage in fuel economy. Uh, but this is a nice car, well done, and five, eight years ago, this thing would have been an absolute knockout of this class. But today, it's just another sedan that nobody seems to want to buy, really. And so that's the 2020 Volkswagen Jetta SEL Premium. This is a good little sedan, and it's a great Jetta, a huge improvement over the outgoing model, and frankly, probably one of the best Jettas ever. It's just that nobody really seems to care about sedans like this anymore, and everyone is more and more interested in SUVs with each passing year. But if you are interested in the Jetta, well, now it's time to give it a Doug score. 
starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Jetta is fine, bland, anonymous, not ugly or attractive, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 7.6 seconds, which gives it a 1 out of 10. Handling is mediocre, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Fun factor is low, there's nothing really fun about this car, and it gets a 1 out of 10. Cool factor is also low, though not completely at the bottom of this category, and it gets a 2 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 12 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. This Jetta is surprisingly well equipped, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Comfort is normal for this class, maybe a bit better, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is good, especially in terms of interior materials, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Practicality is average for a car like this, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Finally, value, and given the equipment levels, this car is a good value. It gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 32 out of 50. Add it up, and the Doug score is 44 out of 100, which places it here against some other compact cars and crossovers. The Jetta slightly beats out the Corolla Hybrid, as the VW has a bit more wow factor and better tech, but mostly the Jetta is simply fine. Nothing more. It's a decent car, but not a special one. Then again, for most people who buy one, that's exactly what they're looking for.